A warm welcome to all the participants who have joined us for this 14th session of uh, our uh, Business Live series. Today, we have another special dialogue on uh, implications of including the rank of PILA in the rules of ICNP. Um, Professor Brian Headland uh, will be moderating the session, and the invited speakers for today are. Uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Aaron Oren and uh, Dr. Karen Lloyd. Um, they will be proposing their point of views for uh, uh, including the uh, phyla in the ranks in the rules of ICNP. And I'll hand over the dais to uh, uh, to Professor Brian Headland, who is our moderator of today's session. Um, Brian, you can uh, please uh, start the proceedings. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Karen Lloyd and Aaron Oren, and I have some boxing gloves up here <laughs> to show a, a debate, but in, in, in reality, I think hopefully this is a good discussion. And, um, you know, my, my real hope is that, you know, we can maybe reach some, some uh, common ideas here and, and maybe have a better future because of discussions like this. And uh, both Aaron and, and Karen are two people that I admire a lot, and I feel that I have a lot to learn uh, from both of them. And so I, I really thank them. Uh, Karen's up uh, late at night in the middle of the night on her uh, short family vacation, and so I appreciate that. And and Aaron, I think uh, I think Karen, you work all the time, but Aaron, I I think you work all the time too, and so we appreciate uh, your Saturday, uh, Aaron. And so I'll just introduce the, the, maybe the problem a little bit really quickly. And, and so maybe the, the issue here started um, when this paper came out and, and this was a paper in IJSEM that really announced that the, um, the ICNP uh, had been amended by the ICSP to allow uh, phylum names to be validated under the code and previously uh, phylum names couldn't be validated in, under the code. And it also describes uh, names to generate or rules to generate phylum names. And, and basically that the phylum names should, should derive from the root of a genus within the phylum uh, followed by a suffix um, ota. So the, the root of a genus name with the suffix ota. And following the, that publication, uh, Aaron and George Garrity went ahead and, and named, uh, validated some, some names. Uh, and in this case, they validated uh, 42 phylum names. And um, here I put two examples where one was a, a very minor departure from a, a, an informal name that had been used for a long time. So Bacteroidota here, is very similar to Bacteroidetes, which was used a, a lot. And then uh, some that were radical departures. So uh, for an example here is Basilota, <laughs> which replaces uh, the inf informal Firmicutes that was used for a long time. And so uh, Karen and uh, Guillaume Tahon wrote a paper uh, uh, about this in, in Nature Reviews Microbiology. and. They essentially argued that that uh, these phylum names um, are, are disruptive to science, and essentially that uh, you know the previous informal names were doing a good job, and that the, the, this, uh, especially the names that were quite different, were uh, uh, distracting and would be difficult for the scientific community. The ICNP replied, and uh, they made a number of points, but I think the most important point is that they said that the community would, would, would quickly adopt the new names and they suggested that it probably wouldn't be a problem or a big problem. And then there was another paper that, that Aaron shared with, with us, with Karen and, and me. Um, and this paper further argues that, that the phylum names uh, are disruptive and argues against the ICNP response. And it discusses some inconsistencies between uh, the ICNP, the rules, and, and some new and existing names. Um, so that's kind of the history of this. And, and at this point, I'll stop my talk. 
So again, thanks very much for this uh, kind invitation. Uh, Kamlesh introduced me as Professor Emeritus, which I am since uh, May 1st, after having reached the age of 70. So I postponed my retirement uh, for a few years, but I will, as uh, uh, Brian expected, just keep doing the same thing that I've been doing uh, before. So nothing will really change from my point of view. So valid publication of names of prokaryotic phyla, finally. And I want to start this with a little disclaimer. I am a member of the ICSP. I'm a member of the executive board of the ICSP. I am working for the IGSCM in different functions. I am working for Burgess Manual, but uh, although many of the views that I'm going to share with you now are also shared by the ICSP executive board and the ICSP, what I'm going to say here now is only in my personal capacity, so I'm not officially representing any uh, organization here. So let's start about talking about these uh, higher taxa. And it's surprising, and it's something that many people do not realize, how relatively short time these higher taxa uh, are with us now. If I check, first of all, uh, 1980, this historic year of the uh, approved list of bacterial names, there are only two names there above the rank of uh, class, uh, which is the Firmacutes, which was then later corrected to Firmicutes, and the Gracilicutes. So it's basically the gram-positive and the gram-negative bacteria. And this is all there was uh, at the time in the approved list 1980. Uh, and when did the current uh, names of phyla that everybody knows uh, start to appear? Also quite recently. I did some research in the, the literature and I found this paper from Carl Vos and co-workers, a historic paper, in fact, in 1985, where uh, Carl Vos, Stackebrand, Mackey and, and George Fox uh, had a phylogenetic definition of the major eubacterial taxa, and they stated here, it is reasonable to define the highest level eubacterial taxa no recognized as phyla or divisions at, le at least. However, until general agreement as to this point exists, the terms used to designate those higher level taxa categories will be in quotation marks, and this is what Carl Rose and co-workers then do in the next sentence. Uh, from 1985, let's go two years later, in this uh, well-known and very highly cited paper about uh, reconciliation of approaches to bacterial systematics by Wayne et al. Um, they state uh, about divisions, there are at least 15 clearly separate lineages, but uh, at the level of division or greater, although the uh, term division was never defined. And kingdom, uh, there is no need at this time for more than one kingdom. A rank such as phylum may be needed in the future. So this is the ancient history. And the uh, naming of phyla really took off in 2001 with the publication of the first uh, volume of uh, Burgess Manual of Systematic Bacteriology, second edition. Here, uh, uh, Bone, Custom, Holtz, Garrity, uh, especially in this chapter by Creek and Garrity, had a massive naming of new phyla. And these are the names that everybody uses today and knows very well. So it's only recent. And when I look in the uh, code, in the International Code of Nomenclature of Prokaryotes, the 2008 version, um, the term phyla doesn't appear. And there is something very curious, which I have never found an explanation for. And that is an example that's given to rule eight. The original version, as I know it, and as, as it was approved in Istanbul in 2008 by the ICSP, as an example to the rule set, example, kingdom prokaryote, the, name, the term kingdom was not in the approved list, so that's fine. And then in the typeset version that can be downloaded from the IGSCM website, it suddenly states domain prokaryote. Also, the term domain 
is not a term that defined. I don't know who made the change, why this change made. I'm also not sure that the ICSP ever approved this change, but it's there. So now let's start to see how other codes of nomenclature, the botanists and zoologists uh, work. And here it's very different. If I look at the ICN, the International Code of Nomenclature for, plant, for fungi, uh, algae, fungi and plants, the botanical code, they have kingdom, they have division or phylum, which for them are equivalent, class, etc. On the other hand, the zoologists do uh, the code does not recognize any ranks above the rank of uh, family, so they do not bother at all with these higher taxa. So um, now in the ICSP, we have been realizing for a long time that phyla are used uh, so extensively that it is time to include the rank of phyla in our code. And a first attempt, uh, at least the first proposal to do this was proposed in 2015, uh, signed by a very broad consensus of uh, people involved in the work of the ICSP. Uh, and uh, in that tentative proposal, we uh, proposed the ending of AOTA to designate uh, phyla, which was then later changed because of it's uh, better grammatically, it's better, it's, it sounds better, et cetera. In uh, emendation of this proposal, proposal to use the suffix OTA, addendum to the earlier proposal, again, a very uh, broad authorship of people involved in this. And this was then brought to the ICSP for a vote. Uh, this is then the slide that also Brian Hedlund uh, showed to us. Uh, the result of the vote was announced. Uh, and I must also stress that before this vote, there was an open discussion uh, that everybody could participate about the uh, naming of phyla. And the result of this uh, ballot was as follows. First of all, should the rank of phylum be included under the rules? 19 in favor, two against, very nice. Then the second question is, what should be the type, the nomenclature type of a phylum? Uh, should it be <coughs> a class or should it be a genus? Uh, seven were in favor of class, 10 were in favor of a genus. So the majority was not very great. But I'm very happy, and I will uh, show this later, why that the genus uh, is the nomenclature type of phylum. It makes our lives much easier. Uh, and then the question whether aota or ota should be the uh, ending, uh, a huge majority in favor of ota. So this is the decision of the ICSP. Then came uh, the Oren and Garrity paper. And here I must stress, and it's a very important point, this is not an official document issued by the ICSP. This was a, a private initiative of the two authors. The paper was submitted not on behalf of the ICSP. It was not submitted fast-tracked, let's say, as our list uh, are uh, published. It was submitted as a regular paper. It was reviewed like a regular paper. So like any paper that proposes a new species or a new genus. Uh, and uh, this paper, the moment these 42 names were published, they were validly published because they agree with the rules of the, ICS, of the uh, ICNP as approved by the ICSP. So not everybody is happy about uh, what we did. So now it's time to respond to a few of those proposals in the Lord and the Home paper. The title of the paper is Science Depends on Nomenclature, but nomenclature is not science. The first question is, is nomenclature science, yes or no? Um, I do not claim that nomenclature is really science, but I do claim that when I deal with nomenclature, I deal with the oldest profession in the world. And the oldest profession in the world is probably not what you think it is. For uh, here you have to prove what the oldest profession in the real world was. Everybody 
And for those who do not uh, read Hebrew, this is the translation. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fall of the air and to every beast in the field. Genesis chapter 2, verse 20. So nomenclature was uh, and taxonomy was there even before the first women were created on Earth. So this is what I'm doing when I deal with nomenclature. So let's uh, <clears throat> go over a few of those points that were made uh, and that in our response to the uh, Lloyd and uh, Tarant paper uh, we described there. So, <clears throat> in the left column, the Lloyd and Tahon version, in the right column, our response. Let's start. The International Committee on Systematics of Prokaryotes has recently altered long-standing phylum names. No, the ICSP did not alter any names. The ICSP did not propose any names. The ICSP only established the rules how to do it and included the uh, rank of filing in the code. Um, disrupting process toward a universal system of, of microbial taxonomy. Here, the ICSP never uh, aims at a universal system of microbial taxonomy. The opposite is true. Principle 1 4, which is probably the most important sentence in the entire code. Nothing in this code may be construed to restrict the freedom of taxonomic thought or action. So the code and the ICSP regulate nomenclature and never taxonomy on purpose. Official names of bacteria and archaea are determined by the ICSP. No, the names are determined by the authors who submit the papers. Uh, the authors who validly publish the names in the IGSEM, either in original uh, manuscripts and papers or in validation lists. The only thing that the ICSP does, they uh, are responsible for the quality control to make sure that those names are uh, meet the uh, uh, requirements. Lloyd and Tahon, the ICSP relies on strict nomenclature rules and experts in the, in the microbial subgroups to ensure that nomenclature is stable and follows polyphasic classification, combining phenotype and genotype. Nomenclature has nothing to do with classification and polyphasic approaches. The terms genotype and geno, uh, genotype phenotype do not occur in the code. So the code deals with completely different uh, issues and the ICSP uh, never uh, uh, dealt with these kinds of uh, nomenclature issues based on, uh, on classification and polyphasic approaches. Then to my surprise, Lord and Tahon state that one of the uh, missing uh, phyla is atribacteria. But if you then check our 42 phyla list, Atribacterota is there. So I don't know why uh, this example was uh, chosen. Then the SILVA database has largely repl replaced ICSP IC for classification. ICSP once more does not deal with classification and it only uh, supervises the publication of the notification list and the uh, validation list, and we are only responsible for, for the, the rules. Uh, and here again, uh, the ICSP voted to decide phylum names. No, the Oren and Garrity paper where the phylum names were published was not endorsed by the ICSP. It was a regular paper in which uh, taxa were proposed according to the rules set by the ICSP in the code. And the ICSP has proposed to change these historic and uh, widely used names three times. Also wrong. The ICSP voted only once for OTA as the ending. Uh, and this is in fact uh, something uh, um, that should not be stressed, uh, uh, should be stressed very well. Historic phylum names have meaning and purpose as they are used for the decades. 
not so many decades, in fact, only two decades, these names are with us since 2001, uh, at least in a well-ordered way. And naming and changing names of higher taxa has been done uh, by others as well. If I look what the botanists do, uh, when I started to study biology and learned about botanical families, I learned about Compositae, Umbiliferae, Labiati, Papillonaceae, etc. cetera, uh, names that are not based on the genus. Now the names of botanical families are based on the genus. So Compositae became Asteraceae, Umbiliferae became Apiaceae, etc. Today, my friends who work with Arabidopsis uh, tell us that this plant be, uh, belongs to the Brassicaceae and no longer to the Cruciferae. Um, what the botanical code, however, does, the ICN, is that they still allow in Article 18.5 the use of the old names. For us in the uh, uh, prokaryote world, we never had validly published old names, so we made a new start. And also in the prokaryotes, it has been done. If I read uh, this uh, um, little essay by Peter Sleeth, uh, which was written 25 years after the, um, val the um, uh, approved list of 1980 uh, were published, Peter Sleeth here uh, re reminds us that also here we have changed names. When I studied microbiology first, I knew that Chromatium belongs to the Theorodaceae family. Uh, but there is no genus Theoroda, so it's today it's Chromatiaceae. We have also done this. So a few words to, the, to finish this about the uh, Panda et al. Uh, a paper, which was just recently uh, published, and I hope that uh, uh, within one or two days, the ICSP will also submit a response to this paper. Um, they came up with interesting ideas. If Pseudomonas is the type genus for the protobacteria, why Pseudomona dota and not Pseudomona sota? So they uh, asked why these uh, endings are like this, and they even accused us uh, to haphazardly append different uh, endings to the, uh, to the names of the, of the genera. Nothing was done haphazardly. Panta et al. failed to check the rules. The uh, uh, rule nine states that the names of these higher taxa are derived from the stem of the name of the type genus. And the stem of these names is found in the genitive uh, case and not in the nominative case. So if Greek monas, genitive monadis, or Latin uh, uh, monados, sorry, Latin monas, genitive monadis, monad is the stem and not monas. So uh, it was just not reading the code properly. And it's to be regretted, of course, that also the editor and the reviewers of the paper did not know better. Uh, uh, Panda et al. were afraid that we'll, we will uh, try to rename alpha proteobacteria to alpha, alpha pseudomona dota or all kinds of uh, these kind of names. No, nobody has an intention to do this. Alpha proteobacteria, beta proteobacteria are validly published names. They cannot be uh, replaced unless the Judicial Commission of the ICSB uh, will decide so. So don't be afraid that we are going to propose even names like this. And the last one of these uh, uh, examples uh, that Panda et al. suggest that instead of proteobacteria, uh, we should have now proteobacteriota. So it's not the old name and not a name that's based on uh, a genus. So I think uh, instead of uh, doing things consistently, these kind of names will even make it worse for these names are not recognized by anybody. I will, okay, now what next? What, uh, where are we going now? First of all, I can announce that uh, we are now publishing uh, the names of three more phyla. 
uh, which are going to be published, I hope so at least, the manuscripts have been submitted in Berger's manual, Halobacteriota, Metanobacteriota, Thermoplasmatota, so three phyla in the Archaea. Um, after these uh, chapters will be published in Berge's, we are going to submit them for validation in the validation list, of course. Um, and another uh, name that we want to introduce is cyanobacteriota. The cyanobacteria is always a problematic uh, um, taxon because of their deltas also by the botanists. Um, but fortunately, the botanists have the genus cyanobacterium. So based on the name cyanobacterium, we can propose cyanobacteriota as the phylum. The only little problem is that the botanical name cyanobacterium is not validly published under either code. So uh, in order to do this, we first need valid publication of the name under one of the codes. The second code will then automatically recognize the name. And then we can uh, propose and validate the name cyanobacteriota. So that's where we are. I will skip those. And I will end again with quoting Peter Sneed in this uh, essay that he wrote 25 years after the uh, approved lists were published. Uh, Peter Sneed here quotes uh, Vic Skerman, uh, who once said, we started something. So my feeling is that also here, when taking the initiative to put the file under the code, we started something. It may be a longer uh, process to have the names uh, uh, in general use, but at least we have the process uh, in order now. And uh, in my opinion, it works. And it's just a matter of getting used to the new names. So that is my message. And uh, let's uh, now start the fight and see the other side. Um, OK, uh, it is 3 AM. And this is definitely the last time I will accept a talk at 2.30 AM. Um, so I hope I make sense, um, but I'm pretty tired. Um, so. Um, uh, I am not a taxonomist or a nomenclaturist, and I get the names wrong <laughs> a lot, um, or the uh, the uh, words mixed up quite a bit, um, because I'm an environmental microbiologist, and I think that it's important when um, figuring out what names are to think about how they're actually used, and to link this to... Um, so uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just gonna give the view of um, an end user that I think is, is pretty um, representative of a lot of folks. Um, and I, uh, I didn't come in with a, a Bible quote, that was pretty good, um, but I've got Dolly Parton. Um, so uh, I am currently at Dollywood um, just for the weekend with my kids as a reward for, um, uh, finishing a lot of work this school year. Um, and I like this quote from Dolly. Um, she says, the way I see it, if you want the rainbow, you got to put up with the rain. <laughs> um, so we have to have to go through some pain to get what we want, um, which what we want is to be able to talk about microbes with each other in a way that reflects um, them and what's useful about them. And I guess the rain that I mean here, are this, I don't know if you guys saw this, article that came out in Wired a couple of days ago. Um, they called up uh, and I talked to them about the, this issue, um, but it's getting some attention. Um, so my, my view is that um, I started in oceanography and so this is what the world looks like to me. I like to flip it around and try to get rid of all the land. Um, it's a reminder that actually we are a, uh, um, a quite an oceanic world. Um, there's estimates of 10 to the 29 living microbial cells buried in Earth's seafloor, which is a third of the microbes on the planet. Um, so if we want to talk about life on Earth, we actually should also talk about life inside Earth, um, which is a very un unknown and undiscovered area. Um, to do this, we go out on drill ships like the Joides Resolution, um, the Shikyu in Japan and Europe uh, contributes mission specific platforms and we pull um, sediments from deep under the oceans up to the ships and then we study them. Um, so the first um, cruise off the coast of the Peru margin um, 
which is about here. Um, I was a part of, I wasn't a part of the cruise, but this is um, the first samples I worked on as a graduate student. Um, and I'll show you the results that we got from 16S surveys, um, not with names of microbes, but with um, little boxes showing you a, a microbe that we got. Um, so when I, we got a microbe that is a cultured strain, it'll be dark blue. And then one that's a novel phylum level novelty um, of belonging to a phylum that doesn't have um, any uh, culture representative, I'll make it white. And then the um, gradient between the two will, will indicate organisms that are maybe a, a part of a genus that has no cultures, um, as far as we can tell. Um, so this is what we got for DNA sequences. We got a, a, quite a few different groups and you can see that they're not very dark. This is um, not things that have been discovered before, but um, fairly new stuff. Some are uh, very white. Um, and so if you think, um, you know, you go into an environment and there are, there's such incredible genetic novelty in it that, you know, obviously the first thing you're going to do is culture this stuff um, because you're going to get something really new. Um, so this, this is what was done on the ship. And I'll put um, every time somebody got a new culture that was the same thing as what we found, I'll put it underneath this. And then other ones that were cultured, I'll line up to the right. And they'll have the same colors, um, either blue for it belongs to a cultured strain or white um, being something really new on the on the phylum level. Um, so the results that I'll line up underneath here are that we didn't get anything um, that we got with 16S uh, sequences. In fact, uh, we got a bunch of stuff that that people had gotten before. And then another group did it and got the same result. Um, so this is something that um, has contributed. This is just our, our part of this world. This, this sort of thing has been going on all over the world with people um, working in the environment. And this, sometimes people call this microbial dark matter, which is kind of a cute name, but um, it just signifies the fact that this is really ubiquitous, um, very, um, uh, I guess, just ubiquitous. You find it everywhere and we don't really know what it is because we haven't grown it. We haven't figured out much about it. Um, so this wasn't just us. Um, we didn't invent um, the diversity, this uncultured diversity. Um, it's now known that deeply branching uh, microbial diversity, uh, that most of it is uncultured. So this is a phylogenetic tree that Brett Baker made in a review that we wrote together. And uh, every um, phylum level group that has a red dot is something that has no cultured representatives. Um, so this is really um, dominating the diversity. Um, but I also wanted to know, um, are these uncultured organisms actually abundant in nature? Are they just um, the, rare, the rare things or are they numerous? Um, so um, I downloaded 16S sequences from metagenomes. So these are collections of all DNA in a sample um, from all publicly available metagenomes. So these are not amplified. These are not um, primer amplified um, 16S libraries. These are uh, libraries of DNA that should be a little more representative of what's actually there. And I took each one of those sequences and figured out how closely related it was to its closest cultured relative. So anything that's out in nature that is similar to what something has been grown in lab, it would have a high um, uh, similarity to a, a known strain. Um, so these are some of the results that we got. So this is <laughs> on the y-axis, we have the proportion of sequences that are, um, uh, closer than 97% similar to a cultured strain. And you can see that humans <laughs> for both archaea and bacteria are quite well cultured. <laughs> I, this actually surprised me. And um, this, this maybe is, um, contributes to some misunderstandings as well. Um, if, if folks are working in the human microbiome, then you know, it certainly is achievable to culture a lot of stuff, um, almost everything. Um, but uh, for all of these other environments, soil, agricultural soil, um, the terrestrial subsurface in rocks, uh, freshwater lakes, um, there's very few of these things that are actually out there in reality are in pure culture and of course have validly published names. Um, and then if you look at uh, novelty at the class, genus to class level, that's where most of the, the microbes are, um, but quite a few are uncultured phyla. Um, so there's actually um, 
in some cases, as much as a third of these uh, microbial populations belong to phyla that have no representatives. Um, so one thing we do um, with these, uh, when we find these new organisms, is that obviously we can't refer to cultures to say what they do. Um, so we infer their functions from their genes, which is not a perfect thing at all. Um, genes can do different uh, activities than what you think, or they may not be turned on. So of course we have to do other things. Uh, we can't just stop at the genes. We have to test the activity through looking at other biomolecules, RNA, proteins, metabolites, uh, lipids, and then we design geochemical assays. Um, we use passive uh, geochemical evidence, um, and we also design assays to see, to verify that these functions that we predict from the genome is actually happening in the environment. And again, I'm not inventing this method of doing things. I'm just one of the many, many people who are doing it. And then the fourth thing we do is one of the most powerful things that we do is that we compare between studies of different environments and geographic regions. And for us to be able to do this, we have to have universally agreed upon names because often you are um, relying on findings from um, scientists in other disciplines. Um, we need to have a common language. I mean, I think, I think this is not up for debate. We, but this is just to emphasize the importance, um, how important names are, um, just to be able to talk about things. And I, I mean that on a, a practical level. Um, so this is the, the group, the International Committee of, on Systematics and, of Prokaryotes. Um, and this is uh, the group that is decided, and I, I know this is a slightly different issue, but it's important to understand the problems with the, the new proposed names of the phyla, uh, to understand that this group um, rejected a proposal within that group to name uncultured organisms, um, to accept genomic material as type material. Um, so they have um, just decided that they're not <laughs> they're not going to handle names of uncultured things. Um, so this is what we do. These are the names that we use. We have to talk about them. These are these are incredibly important organisms on Earth, and we for years have been using names like marine bentha group A, B, C, and D, deep sea archaeal group. These are horrible names. I can pick on them because I named some of them. They're just tragic names. These are not useful. Um, they're hard to remember. Um, so piece by piece, people have been going in the literature and making new names like Loki Archaeota and Bathy Archaeota and Atrobacteria, um, which I, I was actually surprised to see that that one was a uh, validly published name because um, Promethe, was it the, I forgot the name of the, I know that um, Yoichi Kamagata got that in culture. Um, and so um, I guess that's in good enough culture to get an official name, but I was surprised that it, it works to, um, it's in two different um, separate um, culture collections. Um, but, sorry. So what, what we do um, with, instead of using these names that nobody can remember and are complete crap, is that we um, uh, have these other names and these other names, which are totally outside of the code, um, are, have been accepted by uh, the Silva database, um, which really um, just because of the way we conduct this science ends up being <laughs> the de facto authority um, when Silva um, has that particular taxon, um, that's what we, that's the name that we use. Um, and these names are showing up in microbiology textbooks um, and they um, have candidata status at LPSN. So um, this is uh, the, uh, oh, sorry. The LPSN um, has kept pace, sorry, that stands for list of prokaryotic names and standing in nomenclature has kept pace with the candidatus um, status. Um, but of course these, these candidatus names will have really very little hope of becoming ever official or having priority or having any stability um, because um, most of these um, groups are not in culture. I'm sorry, I'm in the lobby of a hotel and, um, and uh, it was completely silent when you were talking, Aaron, and now that I'm talking, there's people, so sorry about that. Um, so, um, yeah, so these names have only been around for 20 years, but we've done a lot of research in 20 years, um, so there's quite a bit of, 20, 20 years is, um, 
maybe a short amount of time in geological terms, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's enough time to get a lot of people in a bunch of different um, fields of research using names. And <clears throat> I think it's kind of amazing actually that we do have the same names that we all call, um, we all think that E. coli is in the proteobacteria. I don't particularly like that name or don't like it, but it's what we use. Um, so then this would now be the Pseudomona doda. Um, and I do, I, I wanna say unequivocally, I really like the oda endings, like having the same endings to signify what taxonomic rank it is, is just like fantastic. Um, I don't see any downside to, to that at all. Um, the tenericutes are now the mycoplasmatoda, the crinarchiota are now the thermoproteota, uh, firmicutes are um, Bacillota, Actinobacteria, or Actinomycetota, um, and this mycy is something that makes people think of eukaryotes and fungi, and Actinobacteria are not fungi or eukaryotes, they're bacteria. Um, and the Thaumarchiota um, have been proposed to be the Nitrospherota. Um, uh, and these, so from the Panda paper, which I enjoyed reading, as is a different take than, than I had on this issue. Um, they point out the principle 1.1 of the ICMP rule book is that it aims at the stability of names. Um, so given that there was no name before, um, it just seems like a very simple thing to, to make it be stable with what people use. Um, it's a real opportunity just to, just to add stability um, that was missed. Um, so principle 1.2 of the ICMP rule book is to avoid or reject the use of names which may cause error or confusion. Um, and these are certainly confusing names um, relative to how we, we use them. So um, what gets better from having these new names, not having new names in general, but these ones in particular, um, I don't see the advantage. Maybe, maybe there's something, but I, I don't see how it helps us to switch Purdue bacteria to pseudomone Dota. Um, what gets worse, um, this is affecting our ability to have a common language across fields. And I realize that this is always the argument when any taxonomic or when any, any nomenclature changes um, is that, you know, oh, we've always done it this way and then people adjust. But um, this one is particularly galling because there kind of was no reason uh, to change it. This is not reflecting some underlying taxonomic uh, mistake. You know, we didn't discover that proteobacteria are actually in a different uh, group than we previously thought, and so they need a new name. It's just simply the names. Um, and we could have had useful ones, but we don't. Um, and given that we've been ignoring official names for years, out of necessity, um, it's, it's just uh, we've had to name our own stuff just to just to talk about our research, just to go about our business in, in oceanography. So given that, given how little usage these official names actually get, will these new phylum names get used? They're gonna get used in some places, but other places they're not gonna get used because of this longstanding issue. And that's gonna be a mess. Um, and of course, you know, you could say, well, that's on you, you know, you should accept new names and, and be systematic. Um, but, but I would argue that it's hard to, to force fields to, to do stuff that really doesn't make any sense for them, um, especially when, the, when an opportunity was there. Um, and this, of course, does not fix the bigger problem that, um, of covering uncultured microbes, um, which is, you know, we still are the Wild West where people just name things wherever and name things after Norse gods and stuff like that. Um, okay, I think that's done. I have no idea how long that was, but. Okay, well, I, I think everybody really enjoyed both those talks and, and I, think, uh, I think they're very useful. So I, I prepared a few questions and I did share these with, with both Aaron and, and Karen just so that they could uh, plan a little bit. Um, and so I, I have six questions, and the, the question essentially is in, in red, but I just left up some text to, to guide me, and maybe people can see a little bit about what I was thinking when I uh, put these questions together. But, um, you know, to me, it sometimes feels par paradoxical that, that uh, the larger research community, and I'm not talking about the, you know, the 
um, systematics experts, but the, the larger research community um, often doesn't uh, look very fondly at formal nomenclature, um, but then you know reacts very strongly when the, when there are changes to nomenclature. And so the basic question is, you know, are formal names important in microbiology? Is it useful to have these names or is it detrimental to have a, a formal system uh, uh, for nomenclature? Maybe I can put this a question to Karen first. Um, I mean, do you think it's it, that many people, many microbiologists think that the name, that formal nomenclature isn't that important, but then sort of perk up when something goes wrong and then it becomes an issue? Is that a useful way to think of it? No, I mean, you could, you could certainly make that argument, but I, I think that having a formal system is really important. And I think that there's always going to be conflict about it. So I think like what we're doing now is sort of a natural um, winnowing out of, of the best way to do things. Um, and it, there's certainly um, problems that are outside of this current discussion. Um, I know that there's uh, a lot of difficulty in getting a name for your strain. Um, and that's sort of a different, different issue when you have a, a pure strain um, that could be talked about. But um, uh, it would be nice if the formal system of nomenclature um, reflected a little more accurately um, what is needed by the field and what is actually happening in nature. Um, that's, that's my problem. Erin, do you have any thoughts about this? Um, yes. Uh, what's, what's the importance of a formal system? I will give three sentences. Uh, the first is general consideration one of the code, which is the first sentence of the code. The progress of bacteriology can be furthered by a precise system of nomenclature accepted by the majority of bacteriologists of all nations. The second is general consideration two. To achieve order in nomenclature is essential that scientific names be regulated by internationally accepted rules. And the third sentence is the, first, the opening of the preface to the first edition of the code, which uh, was published in 1958. And it says microbiologists who have occasion to use the scientific names of the microorganisms with which they deal, generally prefer to use correct names and to use them correctly. I think these three sentences summarize it all without a well-ordered system we are nowhere. Um, so I think we've discussed this uh, uh, pretty well, um, that the ICMP ha has uh, rules and also suggestions for typification and naming for ranks higher than genus. And I, I wrote some of the rules that, that apply here. And uh, for phyla, the, 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 the um, emendations of the code state that the name must be formed by a combination of the root of the genus name appended by the suffix ota. And I think we've already touched on, on some of this, but generally speaking, is this system well-founded and, and useful? And maybe I'll go to Karen first on, on this one again. Yeah, it would, it would be a nice way of doing things if these were the first names that were in use. Um, you know, it's the, the whole approach seems to be um, nothing exists until it's formal. Um, and I mean, this is sort of in general, my, my issue is that there is a lot of science happening and, you know, I don't know. My, it's now it's 3.25 a.m. So I don't know if I'm being articulate, but uh, Proteobacter oda would have been just like awesome, and I wouldn't have to get up at 3 a.m. <laughs> like that would have just been like the coolest name. I would use it in all my papers so easily without any fuss. Um, but I mean, it's nice to have rules too. Um, but maybe there could be a grandfather clause for names that had been in in high circulation to make it to make it simpler. Aaron, what do you think? Okay, I like the approach that uh, we took uh, one uh, type of name with Ota at the end. And uh, Karen probably also likes it if I look at her names of Loki Archeota and uh, Bati Archeota. 
the only thing that is needed is a genus Loki Archaeum and Bati Archaeum, uh, and you have uh, a, a name of a, a phylum that's based on the name of a genus, all according to the rules. Um, the current problem with the IC, ICNP, with the code, is the name, is the way that the higher taxa are formed. Uh, there is some lack of logic. The type of a family is a genus, nice. But the type of an order is not a family, but it's a genus. Why? Don't ask me. Uh, the type of a class, however, is an order. Uh, so that's why we needed to make a decision about uh, the, what the type of a phylum should be, a, cl a class or a genus. And as uh, stated, uh, there was uh, some uh, majority for a genus, and I'm glad that it uh, turned out like this. Uh, we do have, and this is a point that uh, was made in several of the uh, papers uh, that uh, do not like our work, that the naming of classes is highly inconsistent, that there are lots of problems there. And here I agree. Uh, the, there is a problem with rule eight, and especially the uh, retroactivity of some of the clauses of rule eight. Uh, we tried uh, to see if we can include uh, a solution in the upcoming revision of the code, but this uh, solution, if it's there, was not approved yet by the ICSP. So this must be postponed till after and um, the editorial board of the uh, code is now working on a, a proposal for emendation of some of the rules, which again has to go all through all the formal ways of uh, a certain period of time before the ICSP can vote, uh, before the rules, these uh, proposals uh, become uh, incorporated in the code. So retroactivity of uh, um, rule eight uh, is a problem, um, and we're working on it. It will take time. So th this maybe gets, the, <laughs> this has uh, um, been mentioned a little bit, but, um, you know, it, it has been argued in a couple of these papers that it would have been preferable to retain uh, colloquial phylum names, which would ba basically be consistent with, you um, with general consideration one, uh, yeah, or, or is it principle one to aim for stability in names? Um, and, and so maybe Aaron, I'll go to this one uh, for you uh, first. You know, considering the past use of these names, uh, proteobacteria, for example, um, would it have been uh, preferable to have uh, some exception to the rule or to, to propose a name that, that had an exception to the rule so that it were uh, Proteobacterota, um, or, or is it better to, to just uh, keep to the rules and have it be tidy for the future? I think my answer can be very simple. Uh, in the Oren and Garrity paper, the 42 phyla, we simply applied the rules as they were approved. Now, uh, there is a mechanism uh, to change validly published names, and that is the Judicial Commission of the ICSP. The ICSP has a Judicial Commission uh, composed of 12 commissioners who can deal with requests for an opinion that are submitted to make nomenclature changes. It's all, again, in some of the rules of the code. Um, the, uh, it works like this. Anyone who wants to make such a proposal submits, can submit to IJCM a request for an opinion. This request for an opinion is published, uh, and then the Judicial Commission has to deal with this within a time frame of, I think it's now six months, uh, and uh, issue an opinion. Just uh, now, uh, uh, a week ago, uh, a paper with uh, 11 new opinions issued by the Judicial Commission has been submitted for publication in the IJCM. So you can do it and you have to argue why uh, you uh, wish to replace 
uh, let's say, Pseudomonas dota with Proteobacteria or Proteobacteria alta, and uh, the Judicial Commission will then discuss it. Uh, if you check the code, uh, there are certain rules that deal with the work of the Judicial Commission. One of the um, sentences there, I don't have the complete text here, is that uh, uh, the fact that an other name is better known cannot be a uh, um, argument why the Judicial Commission should approve uh, a different name. But again, it's up to the Judicial Commission to make the decisions. If you read the uh, paper in which the inclusion of the file was announced uh, uh, a year ago, then you will also see that the ICSP opens the possibility for uh, app uh, appealing to the Judicial Commission and make changes if people think uh, that it has been done, to be done. So the procedure is there, submit a request for an opinion to the uh, IGSCM to be uh, discussed by the Judicial Commission. Uh, the Judicial Commission will discuss it and uh, issue an opinion, simple. What do you think, Karen? Yeah, um, yeah. That that may be the right way forward. I'm curious about this. Um, that the judicial group doesn't take into account usage and widespreadness, and you know, I can't remember the word that you used, but um, um, my brain really wants to go to bed. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's. Uh, priority what was the word that you used like just the common use like usage i think it was yeah. um it's an interesting choice to not consider usage and and it also it doesn't speak to the chances of success if such a petition because that really is just the only argument um there's yeah. nothing there's nothing else yeah okay let uh, uh, one more sentence about this the uh, statutes of the ICSP uh, give exact instructions how to do this, uh, how to approach the Judicial Commission, and how the Judicial Commission works. Uh, toward the end of the series of rules in the code, there are a few rules that relate to the work of the Judicial Commission. So study those rules, formulate your request to the GC, uh, and uh, see what's going to happen next. Yeah, this is interesting because we, we have a reach into the past and then we have a reach into the future, right? And, and, and so um, using names from the past um, might be confusing in the future. Um, so uh, question four, and here's a re reach into the past. Um, so um, Hitchcock was a, a famous botanist. And in 1909, he has a, a, a paper in science and in that paper, uh, he stated that absolute stability in nomenclature is unattainable so long as botany is a growing science. Um, and so, you know, he, here we have uh, principle 1.2, which is aim at stability. Um, but, you know, stability isn't really uh, completely consistent with, with scientific progress, right? Because scientific progress might say that a group isn't monophyletic anymore or, or uh, you know, something like that. And so this is maybe a pretty general question. Um, maybe I could go to Aaron first. Um, what, what is the right balance to strike here between this, this uh, uh, desire for stability, but then uh, the advances in science that that lead to, to names that that you know don't make sense. Yeah. Uh, you quoted principle one two. Um, I will quote then the what follows the two sentences that follow one three and one four. One three says avoid the useless creation of names. Uh, so what is used is what is not. If you say the phylogeny, the groups are not monophyletic, so reclassifications may be necessary. It's being done all the time. And all the time we have uh, taxa moved from one genus to another as new combinations. 
So this is the uh, balance between aim at stability and avoid the useless creation of names. And um, then principle one four, I already quoted it. Nothing in this code may be construed to restrict the freedom of taxonomic thought or action. So if I want to publish a paper in nature or in science, uh, hoping that the editors and reviewers will accept the idea that Bacillus subtilis is a member of the spirochetes and should be uh, classified in the genus Treponema as Treponema subtile, then I can write this paper uh, after nature or science hopefully will publish my uh, stupid paper. Uh, then I take this paper together with proof that uh, Bacillus subtilis, the uh, basonym, basonym, now Treponema subtile, in my opinion, uh, has been deposited into culture collections, which is easy, and then validate the name. So my Treponema subtile will be a validly published name. Uh, immediately people will say this is all wrong and uh, this is a useless name. But again, this is my taxonomic freedom to uh, do this, and as long as I'll be able to uh, convince uh, editors and uh, reviewers that this is the right thing, I can do it. So there is no absolute stability, and these kind of reclassifications are made all the time, and that's how science progresses. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um... The only problem is when it doesn't reflect, um, you know, that, that example is about a situation where you have data and information driving that change. And of course, you know, that, that has to be done. Um, you have to follow data always um, because who are we? <laughs> you know, nature's gonna do what nature's gonna do. And we're just trying to describe it as best we can. Um, so that has to change as our understanding of nature grows, absolutely. Um, but when the changes are not reflecting data, when there's not nature driving those changes, they're just, just simply disruptive. It's not so useful. And then of course, there's a bunch of nature that's not included in the naming system at all. Most of it. So this one's for, for you, Aaron. <laughs> You've talked about this to some extent, but, um, you know, Panda noted uh, some inconsistencies between existing names and ICNP rules. Um, the class names being, you know, some some good examples, the classes of of uh, pseudomonad pseudomonadota there. Um, so should should those inconsistencies be resolved or, or not? I mean, regardless of whether you're the person to do it, Aaron. But do you think it would be good if those were resolved? Um, so that there were a, a, a better tracing of the names up through the ranks, or is it acceptable that, that the class name would, would be completely different uh, from, from the other names? Yes. Um, these inconsistencies between the rules and the real names, let's uh, separate this into uh, the phyla and the classes. Phyla I do not see any inconsistencies. Panda et al. Uh, noted, I think, nine inconsistencies, which they claim there are there. In my opinion, this is just a matter of not having read the rules of the code as they should have, and not having uh, understood the rule, the, the way that names are formed from stems of, of, of uh, genus names. About the classes, this is again a completely different story here. First of all, we have for all the classes for which we have cultivated uh, representatives, we have validly published names. Some of those names are problematic and may require changes in the future. The issue of retroactivity of rule eight, which is a very complicated uh, issue is now uh, being uh, at least uh, to some extent discussed in the current ballot to approve the new revision uh, of the code. And one of the issues there is about retroactivity, yes or no, of uh, some of the clauses in rule eight, which is again, very complicated. And also to me, 
uh, it's not easy to understand all the implications of uh, what happened here. Uh, but this is very clearly an issue for the field. And therefore, I'm so happy that uh, the genus, the, the phyla are named based on a genus and not on a class. For the uh, nomenclature of the genera is simple and it's well ordered. We have still this mess with respect to classes. So uh, it makes the thing more simple and more transparent. No, that seems like a, a good way to go to, to name them after genera, except for the ones that have been in use beforehand. Um, I don't know. I'm still thinking about this appealing to the Judiciary Committee who doesn't accept prior use as a, as a justification. Um, I really do see a big distinction between changes that have underlying data behind them and changes that are just changes. Argue your case uh, before the Judicial Commission and see what uh, the Judicial yeah. Commission will rule. Um, it's important also to note that the chair, uh, I'm now the uh, secretary of the ICSP, the chair, the secretary, and the members of the uh, executive board of the ICSP can not be members of the Judicial Commission. We have total separation between the judicial system and the, uh, the government. So everything is done in a transparent way as uh, it should. So what do we think? Should it, should alpha proteobacteria be changed or should it be the same? <laughs> That'll be interesting okay. to see. First of all, the name alpha proteobacteria was validly published and uh, it will remain valid, be re, uh, validly published until the Judicial Commission will place it on the list of what's called nomina requienda, the rejected names. Um, what uh, often happens, and the, the name of these nomina requienda is very short, in fact. Uh, check, uh, it's one of the appendices of the code, uh, which names are there. Uh, as long as it's not a rejected name, uh, this name will remain okay, even if another name for the same group has been validly published. So uh, again, check the rules uh, and uh, contact the Judicial Commission even before you want to uh, submit your proposal to get a feeling of what they require and uh, what has been done to uh, get a well-argued uh, request for an opinion, and then uh, let the uh, Judicial Commission do the work. It seems like there's a constant uh, uh, tension between uh, the stability and the tidiness of the, of the names, right? That, that's, I think, an issue that's pervasive here. This might be controversial, we'll see. So the the ICNP, uh, there have been some criticisms of the ICNP that the ICNP isn't inclusive enough and, um, you know, isn't considering community input seriously enough. The, there are solicitations of community input, so that's, that's for sure. But uh, would it be preferable, and I'll go to Karen first here, if ma major decisions were open to community voting like under the ICTV, so for, for viruses, the International Committee on Taxonomy of Viruses. And if so, what kinds of decisions uh, should be open to community voting and, and who would get to vote? Uh, would that be a good thing or, or would that be a bad thing? Yeah, I, I, I don't know the exact answer. So I can't, I can't give like a, a for sure answer, but I mean, it's an interesting thing to, to question and uh, direct voting from everybody has problems um, in governments it has problems so you know most of us live in countries with representational representational democracies um, you know we we elect people to represent us and that's distributed across our geographical regions um, and our governments um, but currently for these names for microbes it is not um, distributed across our geographical regions well at all. Um, South America is unrepresented as far as, unless something has changed, um, and Asia is also poorly, poorly represented. Um, so these sorts of things make it difficult to accept 
um, the authority of the, the nomenclature system. Um, it just adds to, to that, the geographical variation um, in representation. Mm -hmm. But also, um, for me, it's really hard to, to really feel like this is an authority when it doesn't do anything about the uncultured organisms. That's a really, um, uh, what's the word? so, okay, so the question was, should hmm. these changes be voted on by everybody? That seems like a mess. <laughs> I just think that would be a huge mess. Um, so something similar to what's, what's happening now, just with representation uh, amongst different fields of science and different geographical regions and different people who use these, these who do microbiology in different ways, um, I think would strengthen the, the code and make it more useful to a wider range of people. What do you think, Aaron? Okay. Um, the statutes of the ICSP state that all business of the ICSP is done publicly. And we try to do this as much as possible. Uh, for example, that's why we put the uh, vote uh, about the phyla after we had a public discussion online on this and everybody could participate. Also, the code itself, the new revision of the uh, uh, prokaryotic code, the previous one is the 8, 2008 revision. Now we are uh, in the process of having the ballot for the 2022 revision. There was a six month period uh, in which uh, there was an open discussions on Slack and everybody could have uh, participated and this was published, publicized as well, uh, very broadly. So anyone who should uh, be, uh, want to participate could have done this. Now I am aware and we are all aware of the fact that the ICSP is a small club uh, because of the rules of the YOMS, International Union of Microbiology Societies, of which the ICSP is what they call the COMCOF, Committees, Commissions and Federations, under the YOMS. And uh, if I look at my screen and I see Brian Hedlund and Karen Lloyd, who are most probably members of the ASM of the American Society for Microbiology, the American Society for Microbiology does not have a representative in the ICSP because of the American Society for Microbiology is not a member of YOMS. I don't know why, maybe they do not want to pay the membership fees to, uh, to YOMS, uh, something like this. So uh, a small uh, society like BISMIS has a representative in the ICSP, which is Barney Whitman. Um, uh, and all kinds of small uh, um, uh, societies do have uh, delegates to the ICSP while the big ASM does not. Now, uh, we in the ICSP know the problem. Uh, and uh, a few weeks ago, uh, our chair, uh, Ian Sutcliffe, uh, contacted uh, the secretary of the uh, YUMS, uh, Rob Samson, with the question, is the ICSP willing to allow the ICSP, uh, the, is YUMS willing to allow the ICSP uh, to expand its membership, either uh, by allowing more uh, representatives from big societies or by co-option on a wider scale, etc.? And uh, the YOMS uh, secretary was uh, surprisingly willing to uh, allow this. So they uh, put it, uh, the question back to us, uh, think about the system to change it, uh, propose a change in the statutes of the ICSP, uh, submit this proposed change to YOMS and we'll see what we can do for you. So uh, they were happily and surprisingly maybe very open to uh, helping us to become more representative of the community of microbiologists. This is a process that will take time. Um, if you, um, uh, today is Saturday, yesterday we had, uh, no, the day before yesterday on Thursday, we had again our monthly executive board meeting of the, IC, of the ICSP. The minutes of these board meetings are published 
on our website about uh, six weeks after each meeting. Uh, check in about a month, uh, two months from now, what has been discussed uh, on uh, uh, May 19, and you will see that uh, we get the process uh, going. It will take time, but uh, uh, we are aware of this criticism. It's fully uh, justified, um, and we are doing our best to change it, but we need the uh, okay from our superiors, which is in this case, the International Union of, Syst of uh, uh, Microbiological Societies, YUMS. That sounds like it might be an interesting update for all of us, right? <laughs> check, check the minutes of our monthly uh, uh, executive board uh, sessions. They are open to the public. They are published uh, on our website. And you can exactly see what keeps the uh, executive board busy there. What about the second question of representation of re representing microbes that don't grow in pure culture? Okay, this is, this is again, very simple. Um, the, uh, let's get back to Barney Whitman's modest proposal paper 2016, which is the basis of all the following discussion. These proposals were formally submitted to the ICSP. The ICSP rejected these uh, uh, modest proposals with a great majority. So uh, the bottom line is that the ICSP, our uh, plenary, not the executive board, but the, uh, the people, the plenary uh, at least that we have, it says, no, we are not going to do this under the uh, uh, new rules of the, uh, of the code. We have the candidatus uh, status, which does not have priority in nomenclature. Uh, so this is the bottom line of the vote of the ICSP. I know that there is today uh, this uh, SEC code initiative and uh, some people who are involved in the SEC code are here in the panel and probably many more in the audience. So let's see where this uh, will be going. The uh, system, the democratic system of the ICSP operated uh, in uh, exactly according to the statutes and the vote was very clear. All right, um, do we... Uh, you know, I know it's getting late. <laughs> um, does Gaurav Sharma want to come in for a couple minutes? Can I share my slide also? Like, just I have quickly made like you know just to showcase the points. I just made like two, one slide actually, or maybe two. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you first of all, Kamlesh, for giving me this opportunity. I just quickly want to say that okay, I'm a very young researcher as of now, and. Uh, just recently came from a postdoc at UC Davis with Mitch Singer, and now I'm, I'm, I have my own group here at IBM Bangalore in India. And we are working on a lot of microbial genomics, plant genomics, and the prediction servers. So I will say like uh, we are the end user, as uh, Karen told, and uh, I just want to bring like two, three points, okay? And uh, mm -hmm. I think like many of you have already read our paper that, <clears throat> you know, like obviously rules are important, and I really appreciate ICSP, what they are doing. And this OTA word, OTA suffix, it's really important. It was, uh, it was uh, earlier, it was very misleading, but some exceptions can bring conservation and uniformity, okay? And that's what we are trying to say here. We are not saying that you, 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 we get back to the previous thing, but the only thing here is that OTA is good, but the suffix, the prefix, it can stay same for the largely used words. That's it, okay? Means we really appreciate what you guys are doing. And uh, this change will affect a lot, whatever we have done or whatever researchers has done from the last 20, 30, 40 years, okay? As uh, or in told that, you know, obviously these names are from 20, 30 years old, but it's still in those 30 years, the internet era has begun everything is online, everything is widely distributed. And uh, if we are going to change this, the change, this change will not be so minute. 
as compared to that change which happened which happened like 30 years before okay if any change happened 30 years before maybe at that time obviously it would have felt like really a big change but the change which will happen now it will be really uh, gigantic okay J another point i just want to say it okay means again i'm sure many of uh, the end user will have this issue that should we keep using latin greek language standards or rules in taxonomy okay again means i am pro for all the changes as i said but i always feel and i will i'm sure like many of you will agree that uh, pseudo monodota is not a right word as compared to pseudo monosota even if we are going ahead with this change pseudo monosota is easy to understand easy to use easy to implement I mean, that is my suggestion okay I means again as i said that you know that uh, obviously as orange told that pseudomonodota is based on because uh, of uh, uh, like the the words the word uses based on latin or greek but pseudomonosota is easier and similarly if we are using actinomycetota it's easier to understand as compared to the as compared to the what has been proposed or similarly aquificota okay or like whatever we have used whatever we have suggested in this uh, uh, mbio opinion i believe that uh, those options are easy to understand easy to implement easy to remember and uh, yeah okay coming to the next point and again we have proposed it in our in our paper that uh, should not the tag archaeota be a separator means it will still have ota which is kind of a phylum denominator but having archaea will give it a give it a separation from bacteria okay again as i said you know it is our opinion and uh, means we will see like you know what we can do next but having archaeota as a suffix for phylum name belongings to archaea it will definitely make a separation between bacteria and archaea okay and the last part as uh, we have uh, we have discussed in our paper that uh, and i'm sure like as oren told that you know they are planning to um, give a reply to that so you are kyota was not changed to methanobacteriota okay again eukaryota you are eukaryota is like the one of the largest archaeal phylum but it was not changed ideally it should have been changed in methanobacterium methanobacteriota but maybe some exception was made or there was there might be something else also because i don't know and one and all these things i'm planning i'm saying because and first point is that i'm not a taxonomist okay as oren and other many prestigious people will be so i'm just a end user computational genomics person so these like i may not be aware of many rules okay but what we are trying to portray is that uh, there should be a there should be an equilibrium between the stability and getting confusion okay like uh, the end user who is the largest uh, la largest user at, la not largest user is the largest uh, user who will use these words okay like the taxonomist will be obviously using these things but the end user will be the one who will directly get affected by all this so there should be an equilibrium between stability of the rules and getting away from the confusion and i think that's all that i wanted to say and yeah thank you thank you gaurav thank you um, thank you brian uh, aron would like to comment on it i think aron is already raised his hand yet yeah of course mm -hmm. i have to comment to this Uh, first, my first comment is that I am also not a taxonomist. People think that I'm a taxonomist, but I still feel myself a microbial ecologist who has spent most of his career on hypersaline environments, uh, life at high salt concentrations, uh, ecology, physiology, and some taxonomy of the organisms that uh, inhabit these uh, environments. Uh, if people think that I am a taxonomist, it's because of uh, some of the things I've been doing in nomenclature, etc. It's a hobby of mine, and uh, maybe this hobby got out of hand a bit and uh, became more an obsession than a hobby lately. But still, I feel myself a microbial ecologist. 
Second, about the ah, there you are. Uh, about the uh, question pseudomona dota versus pseudomona sota. This is very simple. From the genus pseudomonas, we have today pseudomona dacee and not pseudomona zacee, pseudomona dalis and not pseudomona salis. So it's the same logic that's behind all these names. Uh, according to the way uh, names are formed so based on the code. Again, uh, the, the stem, or if you want the root of the name is of a Latin word, comes from the genitive and not from the nominative case. Um, uh, and uh, in order to understand this, you have to understand a little bit how Latin grammar works. Uh, Latin or Greek, uh, yes or no, one sim simple sentence, I've seen the draft of the SEC code, which is the uh, code now in preparation for the uncultivated majority, and it has exactly the same rules based on Latin and Greek, which are all based on, in fact, uh, Linnaeus uh, Philosophia Bot Botanica 1751, uh, so even the SEC code, which uh, is supposedly to be uh, uh, an alternative way of doing things, has exactly the same rules. And my uh, last comment about archaeota, yes or no, for all the archaeal phyla, uh, this is first of all a matter of taxonomic opinion. Uh, the code uh, applies to all prokaryotes. And if I decide that my uh, favorite uh, genus, let's call it Haloferax, uh, an archaeon, a halophilic archaeon, belongs to the actinobacteria, I can do that. And that's a matter of taxonomic opinion. So the moment you uh, propose archaeota for all uh, archaeal uh, phyla, it means that uh, you already confuse nomenclature with issues of taxonomic opinion. Moreover, as I showed in one of my last slides, uh, the names of three archaeal uh, phyla uh, have now been submitted in papers in Burgess Manual, Halobacteriota from Halobacterium, Metanobacteriota from Metanobacterium, this is the example that you gave, and uh, the third was um, um, uh, Thermococota, I think, I, I, if, I, if I remember well. And as soon as Burgess will publish these uh, papers, then we will submit the names for validation in the validation list in IGSCM, and they will become validly published um, to be added to the uh, 42 names of phyla that are already published. So, so here's a question for, for Aaron. So that's good because he's, st he's still here and wide awake. So um, it's an anonymous uh, question. So Firmacuties gives 27.6 million hits in a Google search and 127,000 unique hits in Google Scholar, uh, not excluding, not including patents and references. Uh, couldn't you imagine a nomenclature that allowed exceptions for names that are already considered uh, generic? The mechanism exists. The Judicial Commission can decide. Whoever this anonymous person uh, can uh, submit a request for an opinion to the Judicial Commission. Uh, Google and Google Scholar are terms that are not in the code. So um formulate your uh, uh, request for an opinion and uh, wait and see what the judicial commission is going to do there's a question from uh lee lee mung that maybe i can answer quickly so um or no wait um no i'm sorry uh balaram uh um uh, uh moha patra so it's a question about why the beta proteobacteria has been included in the in the gamma proteobacteria in silva and, and green genes, and so that wouldn't wouldn't necessarily be a question for for Aaron, um, but the reason for that is that it's it's been shown a long time ago 
that the beta proteobacteria are, are uh, uh, and gamma proteobacteria are, are monophyletic with, with beta proteobacteria within the gamma. And so uh, there are phylogenetic arguments which have been made quite a long time ago that I think, I think Silva and green genes are, are following there. Um, so epsilon is, is, is not within that monophyletic lineage. So I think that's why, why that decision has been made. Um, okay. Here, My here's reply, a I want quickly to say uh, one more sentence here. Uh, is this an updates and amendments for ICSP rules? None whatsoever. For ICSP rules do not deal with uh, issues of taxonomic opinion. Again, right. if I want to reclassify Bacillus subtilis as a triple name, I can do it. And it has nothing to do with the rules of the ICSP. You know, one, one important thing that underlying all of this is databases. And, and that came up uh, certainly in, in Karen's uh, paper. Um, you know, databases do make decisions and uh, the databases are speaking out to a lot of the user community. So the databases actually have a, a, a lot of a lot of power in, 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 in taxonomy. Okay, I'll read it out. So the, the topmost question that needs to be asked is, uh, is from Ian. I think it's more of a comment. Ian says both proteobacteria and permicutes are each likely umbrellas for multiple phyla. And it has been well illustrated by the work of human holes and colleagues. And so why cling on to informal names for polyphyletic taxa, which will probably only be in use for one, two decades, rather than embracing the formal naming of monophyletic taxa that are more likely to be stable and useful in the long future. So that's, uh, that's a comment from Ian. The question, uh, the next question is from Meng Li. And the question is, if, we, if the alpha, beta, or gamma proteobacteria do not change the names, how do we keep consistency with their higher taxa like pseudomonadota? If they change, and it will take more complex for the microbial taxonomy. So basically, the question is again on a, uh, answered already that alpha, beta, and gamma proteobacteria are already validly published names. So nobody is going to touch them. And then um, Alessandro Costa has a question. Uh, bacteria in Archaea taxonomy apply less ranks than any other kingdom. Do you have a good reason for it? I, I think Aaron would be able to answer that. I think Aaron can not answer it for I don't understand the question. Uh, I think the question relates to the taxonomic ranks are uh, less in bacteria and archaea as compared to like the uh, zoological system or the botanical system. Well, the, the viral system especially. Yes, I think yes. Would be a good example. Mm -hmm. If anyone can explain to me the viral system, then you're very good for I haven't been able to understand it yet. Okay. It's quite complicated, but they, they have a lot more ranks um, than, than, than we have. So the question is, why, why do we have the ranks we do and not yeah. more? Yeah. Uh, the next question is uh, from Panos uh, Venter. Uh, would the problem not be avoided in future if people who want to name a new phylum also describe a genus, like a type material, at the same time? This problem was also highlighted by Chuvachina et al. in 2018 paper. For me, this is a simple question. No. Uh, why do people start with a phylum? The basic uh, unit of taxonomy is a species that belongs to a genus. So start describing the genus and the, the, the type species, and from there go up to the higher ranks. Uh, uh, that is the, the natural way of doing things and not start uh, naming phyla and then see what uh, kind of uh, organisms or sequences, if you wish, you can classify uh, uh, within that new taxon. 
the, let, the natural way is to start with the species and the genus. Okay. Um, most of the other questions that relate are, uh, are very specific, like what is the new status of a particular taxonomic uh, group? Like, could you please tell the status of Enterobacteriaceae? So I, I think the person has to read the actual publications to understand that. Okay, the Enterobacteriaceae has been a topic of many requests for an opinion to the Judicial Commission. All mm -hmm. you have to do is open, uh, I don't remember which appendix uh, uh, of the code it is. I think it's appendix seven or eight, which has all the uh, opinions issued. And you will find there are quite a few that deal with uh, the Enterobacteriaceae questions. So uh, read what the Judicial Commission has ruled about this. Um, Brian, if you would like to take any other question from the remaining ones, otherwise I'm done. Um, I, I think it's okay. I, th I think we've covered it quite well and, and okay. uh, Aaron's done a nice job with all of this. And, and I'm really thankful for Karen uh, staying up on, on her family vacation as well. Yeah, um, um, I would like to then uh, close the session for today. Uh, before I go, I'll just make a quick announcement for the next one. Uh, the next session will be uh, uh, held on June 18th and the speaker will be Dr. Taiki Katayama from the Geological Survey of Japan. And the topic will be cultivation and characterization of the uh, artery bacteriota. So that's the new uh, uh, phylum name that, that's been coming up. Um, and uh, I thank Aaron and Karen uh, for being uh, so upcoming and forth with, with the discussion. And uh, especially Karen, it's probably 4, 4.13 in the morning and she's uh, gone off to bed. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for... Uh, uh, for the discussion, Brian, especially for moderating the session and being awake himself. Uh, this is probably uh, for you. It'll be three fifteen in the morning, I believe. Oh, what one one fifteen? So it's not so okay. bad. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Gaurav, for sharing your point of view. Um, we'll meet uh, on the third Saturday in June again.